What's euphoria? It's euphoria after you do a 10 hour effort like that. Although you're exhausted, you just can't believe that all that training paid off and that those scientists are going to be so happy. Day five of their mission, there is still work to be done. Michael Fole and Claude Nicolier must change the telescope's main computer. The size and number of the connecting pins have been on Michael's mind since he first received the assignment seven months ago. This is no job for a robot. And there's about a thousand gold pins, tiny ones, that could be bent by me, by my ham-fisted hands in spacesuit gloves under pressure, moving stiffly. I could easily knock one of those gold pins and prevent connecting them to the new computer. And if I couldn't get them onto the new computer, we were going to be in big trouble because then there is no computer able to run the telescope. The astronauts make it look easy, but there is a trade-off. They are in constant danger. A serious tear in their gloves or spacesuits would cause instant depressurization and prove to be fatal in seconds. Or if the life support system malfunctions, they may have only seconds to get back to the shuttle. Claude and Mike are replacing a fine guidance sensor, part of the telescope's positioning system. An alarm goes off in Claude's spacesuit, indicating an extremely high level of carbon dioxide. High message. Okay, let's stop the arm. Okay, stop the arm. Push the FGS widely back in. I'll hold it, please. I'm holding it. Carbon dioxide can cause you to be dizzy, have a headache, go unconscious. Um, it's something that normally would immediately force us to stop the spacewalk and go back to the airlock. And Discovery Houston, uh, we think that that is a PPCO2 deucer. It jumped up to the highest possible level uh, too, quickly, too quickly to be a real physics, so we call it a deucer. Okay, how are you feeling? I feel fine. And Houston Discovery, with your concurrence, what we'll do is continue here, and uh, we'll make sure Claude continues to feel good. The crisis is over when the astronauts determine that the CO2 sensor is faulty. While the astronauts completed most of the tasks, the mission was neither easy nor perfect. On my previous two missions, I thought we worked really hard. You know, we, we had you know, 14 or 16 hour days that were pretty full. On this mission, I learned what working really hard means. They were the second, third, and fourth longest spacewalks ever. And the reason for that is we had several little things that kept going wrong. And it was nothing that um, universally has changed in the space shuttle program or in the Hubble program. It's just the age of equipment and really luck, too, or bad luck. The Discovery crew has brought Hubble back to life, but their work is not done. To keep it soaring, they will have to return to change out its eyes and its heart. The launch and servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope has been one of the greatest legacies of manned spaceflight. But the astronauts did not stop there. Hubble was designed to capture light at visible wavelengths. Astronomers aimed the next great observatory at another form of light. We know it from the deadly blast of a nuclear bomb. Gamma rays are the product of the most violent events in the universe. In 1991, astronauts launched the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory to map the gamma ray sky. For nine years, it probed exploding stars and the fiery center of our galaxy. Finally, its gyroscopes, like those aboard Hubble, began to fail. While engineers eased Compton down into the Pacific Ocean, astronauts prepared to launch another powerhouse of high-energy astronomy, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Columbia Houston, uh, we have a good downlink and a great view of Chandra. Chandra vastly extended Compton's work. By capturing X radiation, it revealed the most violent and energetic events in the cosmos. The swirling, overheated realm of dead stars. Shock waves from supernova explosions. Black holes and other strange objects glowing in the center of our galaxy. Chandra produced a quantum leap for astronomy, and it fueled anticipation for advanced images from Hubble. 
First, a team of astronauts would once again have to brave the extremes of space. Space flight is still a very risky business. And in the first eight and a half minutes in the launch to orbit, you know, you think this is nuts. You know, this is not something people should be doing. The fourth mission would last 11 days, but only five days are available for telescope servicing. It will be the most invasive overhaul to date. It was probably the most ambitious of any of the servicing missions because not only were new instruments being installed, but all kinds of uh, surgery that was never designed to be done was going to be attempted. As if the mission is not complicated enough, it suddenly turns critical. While the shuttle Columbia is being readied for liftoff, Hubble's pointing system malfunctions. We had an electrical glitch that occurred with uh, reaction wheel number one and our experts looked at it and their assessment was that this was a problem that was going to come back and get worse and that the best thing to do would be to change that wheel out. The reaction wheel assembly is used for controlling the pointing of the Hubble Space Telescope and the Hubble needs to point very, very accurately with very little jitter in order to take a really good picture. This last minute development results in a two week delay. In five day long spacewalks, Columbia's crew will not only install the guidance wheel, but new solar arrays, thermal insulation, a power controller, one new camera, and the parts to fix another. Hubble never sleeps. Uh, it, it circles the Earth 15 times uh, roughly every 24 hours, and it is always doing science. And these uh, investigators, the scientists using Hubble, come from all over the globe. Every time we visit Hubble, we have these quantum steps and capability, factors of 10 and 20 and 30 improvements. Not tiny marginal improvements, but big, big gains. And, um, you know, personally, I, I don't think we've reached the limit of that capability yet. Hubble has uh, led to a number of discoveries that have rewritten the textbooks. We've confirmed the existence of black holes. We've learned about the atmospheres of planets around nearby stars. We've confirmed the expansion rate of the universe. We've dated the universe. Launch day, March 1st, 2002. It was the first time I was around a fully loaded space shuttle. So it's making all kinds of hissing noises and there's smoke coming out of it and then it was dark out and it was, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very pleasant. It was a little intimidating looking at this thing. I see the astronauts on the pad surface now, having just gotten off the astrovan and heading for the fixed surface structure. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia to broaden our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. Once in space, trouble appears. This time, it's the shuttle itself. Peter, what we've been looking at with that is that uh, it appears that uh, we have a possible restricted flow somewhere in uh, the system on loop one. The computers needed to ensure a safe return to Earth are in danger of overheating. One side of Columbia's cooling system is clogged. Should the crew rush home now or risk another blockage that would cripple the shuttle? It's a reminder of the risks astronauts have undertaken on Hubble's behalf. However, we just want to give you a heads up. Uh, ECOM is taking a hard look and uh, will be monitoring the performance over the next day or so to come up with a, a good game plan and an understanding of exactly what's going to be affected. It was actually on our Saturday, our second day up there, when I heard the words come up from the ground, oh, it looks like we won't have to bring you